Funding for Elwood City Limits is brought to you by Leanne S., John Dulong, Josias Melendez, and Ian Collis. Listeners like you. If you'd like to support this podcast, go to patreon.com slash Elwood City Limits. Hmm. Terry Rozier, a more clutch player in the finals than Kyrie Irving? I mean, that's kind of a hot take. Chris Stapps, they should, the Knicks should trade Chris Stapps Porzingis? I, I, I don't know. Oh! Hello! I didn't see you there! I'm Lucas Mancini of the Elwood City Limits Podcast. Welcome to my humble abode. Uh, while you're here, I'd just like to remind you that Elwood City Limits is recorded in beautiful Halifax, Nova Scotia by the ocean. And Halifax, Nova Scotia has their Best of Halifax Awards that you can vote in from June 1st to July 15th. And what do you know? As this podcast is recorded in Halifax, it's eligible for the best podcast from Halifax. All you have to do is go to bestofhalifax.com, scroll down to the media section, and type in Elwood City Limits as your nomination for best podcast. You can even write a little blurb about why you think it's the best. It would be really great if you're a fan of Elwood City Limits to head on down to bestofhalifax.com and nominate us. Thanks! Funding for Elwood City Limits is brought to you by Facebook. Facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. Twitter. At ECL Podcast. Tumblr. ElwoodCityLimits.tumblr.com. Email. ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. And by contributions from listeners like you. Literally at ElwoodCityLimits.Libson.com. Thank you. Cha-ching, cha-ching, baby. <laughs> Well, uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I sound a little bit different today, Lucas Mancini. But uh, <laughs> I decided to bite. I decided to bite the bullet, and I've decided to not upgrade, but I've decided to make a little bit of a of a quick change for this episode. Can you can you tell what it is? Is it? Uh, are you? Do you have a new shirt? Um, no, not not, I, not today. I know. I'm looking at a new Skype profile picture. Could that be it? Perhaps, per chance. That, that is that is a change, but it's not the one I'm talking about. Oh, uh, could it be that crystal clear HD audio I'm hearing? I certainly hope it is, at least when uh, <laughs> when the final product comes around. That's right. Uh, recording off of a new Blue Yeti microphone, uh, m- much like yours, the one that you use as well. They better sponsor the show for all this free advertising they're getting because, who boy. Uh, but no, I, I rather enjoy mine. It's very convenient for an amateur like myself, so... Um, sort of a plug it and play USB, nothing too high end, and it gets the job done, or at least I hope it does. Yeah, believe it or not, uh, we uh, we don't necessarily consider ourselves professionals here on the Elwood City Limits podcast, the only episodic Arthur podcast. Welcome everybody. Uh, this is Will Young, and that's Lucas Mancini, and we are your hosts. The only thing I'm a professional is a professional goofball. Was that were you were was that what you were voted in your yearbook? No, I was voted in my yearbook most likely to be on TV. <laughs> and you kind of were. I mean, kind of. Even... It's true. Uh, my friend, my friend Josh was voted biggest gamer. Oh, and there and there you go. You guys have a stream. <laughs> there you go. That's right. I haven't plugged this on the podcast in a while. Go to YouTube.com. Search up Bally Stream. Watch all the archives. I highly recommend the video where we play Alien Hominid. Uh, oh, man. That's a fun one. Man, talk about games that I used to play on Newgrounds.com back in the day. Mm, the console version's very hard. Very, 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 very hard. But we beat the first two levels, so. Speaking of video games, I want to give a quick shout-out today. We are actually recording on the day of the birthday of Nitro Rad. Nitro Rad, a previous uh, guest here on Elwood City Limits. He is a fantastic video game reviewer over on the YouTube.com. And he's also the one who made our Elwood City Limits logo. So a big happy birthday to Nitro Rad today. We need to have him on the show again one of these days. It was fun. That was very early in the Elwood City Limits canon. So it would be nice to have him around again. I have an idea that I'm kicking around that I kind of hope to present to him I'd love to meet I'd love to meet him in person so I could kind of talk about the possibility uh, with him someday but uh, but trust me but trust me I, I'm, I'm thinking about something <laughs> you get something rolling up there in the old noggin 
Before we get started on today's episode with uh, in all of its glory, uh, of course, we have some emails to answer over at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. Uh, the first one came in right under the wire last week, uh, right after we finished recording. Uh, it is from Kelsey, who has written into us before, still enjoys it very much. Uh, Kelsey writes a lot of Arthur fan fiction that she says should never see the light of day. But Kelsey had an idea for an episode, wanted to see what we thought of it. Well, I mean, if there was any episode to talk about fans submitting ideas, uh, <laughs> this is this would be the one. Arthur and Buster end up helping Mr. Ratburn move his mother into a nursing home so oh they could God. get at, so they could get out of doing some homework. Well, already his mother's not like senile. I feel like she'd figure out what was going on. But things take a turn when Buster overhears an argument between Ratburn and his sister Rodentia about what to do with their dad's things, and Nigel decides the house shouldn't be sold due to it being dad's house and that his things shouldn't be touched since Mr. Ratburn's dad is no longer around. Then he suggests that Rodentia should move into the house to take care of their mom. Buster and Arthur try to help them solve their issue, but they end up taking sides in the end. Then the brain ends up getting involved by having Nigel and Rodentia debate against each other. The debate doesn't go as planned. Will Arthur, Buster, and Brain be able to convince Mr. Ratburn that selling his childhood home would be the right choice? This is... Ooh, this is deep. This is like for the... uh, for the five years later, this is like for the Arthur five years later season. It's like, this is some Riverdale Arthur stuff. Remember when we <laughs> talked about the dark Arthur <laughs> reboot? Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, some, you know, nothing like a good fighting over a will. Uh, and I, I don't mean that in jest, too. I like, like, I like Clue and stuff like that, where it's like people trying to figure out what to do uh, with their valuables. After someone's passed. It's really mm-hmm. interesting. Uh, we, I, I would just like to see... Uh, more of rapper and sister again. She's a fun character that, much like I, I call this the Spanky effect, where a character shows up and is fun. You could also call it the Arthur's uncle effect, where a character shows up, steals the show, and is never seen from again. Uh, I'd like to see more from our, uh, excuse me, Mr. Rapper and sister. Absolutely. Interesting idea, Kelsey. I'd like to see you f- uh, flesh that out a little bit more. Uh, and uh, that could be something. Our next one is from Ur's Cat. Uh, they say, hey guys, I live in Maryland in the U.S., just around the midline between northern and southern states, and I've seen Poison Ivy many times. We were talking about Poison Ivy on the last episode. Granted, I haven't seen much of it since I hit 18 and haven't had as many opportunities for camping and hiking, but I remember seeing it multiple times. I've seen it in various nature summer camps and scouts camping trips. I even think I got the rash a few times. It hasn't shown up every time. But it is definitely something to keep in the back of your mind and look out for when going out in leafy areas where I live. For what it's worth, I've also gotten stung by nettles once. I learned not to make that mistake again. Be careful in the woods near creeks from Ur's cat. Uh, forgive my ignorance, Will. What are nettles? I'm not really 100% sure. Whenever I think of nettles, I think of salad fingers. Nettle long bottom. Um, huh. <laughs> yeah, see... When I hear things like that, it sounds like it's so common to run into poison ivy, where it's really something... I think last time we came to the conclusion that it is around here, we did an ancillary Google search and figured out that there is poison ivy here in Nova Scotia, but I feel like we'd have to really go looking for it to find any. It's not just something hmm. that you can run into by accident. Yeah, you'd have to have your uh, your plant encyclopedia at hand in order to find it where we are. Our next one comes in from Ian, who I would like to add is our latest Patreon donor. Ian, thank you very much. Thanks, Uh, Ian, and enjoy the latest episode of Filibuster. Uh, I was really proud and uh, had a lot of fun recording my segment uh, for the newest Filibuster episode. And I was happy to finally get to talk about Common Rider, and hopefully uh, that was fun for our patrons as well. Thank you, Ian. Uh, getting Ian must have gotten his first job, as he says in the email, so congratulations on your job. Uh, Ian says, not Arthur-related, but I was wondering what politics are like in Nova Scotia. In the States, we hear a bit about your national elections as well as those in Ontario, but not much about you East Coasters. Well, maybe this is a time to say that, Lucas, your dad is involved in Nova Scotia politics to a degree. Uh, On a municipal level, not on a uh, a provincial level, which here means, I guess, uh, I'm not sure how 
branches of government differ in the United States, but in Canada, there's you know federal, uh, provincial, and municipal. And municipal is the the city, uh, provincial is the province as a whole, so Nova Scotia, and then federal is of course the whole country. Um, and yeah, my dad is a city councilor for uh, a district, um, and it's a it's a fairly low population here in Nova Scotia. So I think a lot of people are pretty involved with the uh, municipal politics and the uh, provincial politics, just because it's so hard to avoid because there's so few people. I'll also say that a lot of people get confused with the Canadian political system because the uh, provincial parties and the federal parties have the same name but it's not necessarily the same thing it's really confusing even some people i know who are my age still don't quite understand that um though there is a ndp party and a liberal party and a conservative party for canada um the provincial liberals aren't necessarily the same as the federal liberals um and they the way they interact with each other and work with each other uh is very different than the way the uh political parties I'm to understand work in the United States. So it could be kind of confusing if you didn't grow up in this system, uh, but that's basically the way it works. Uh, we currently have a liberal government, um, though uh, there's been a few scandals. I don't want to speak at a turn here, but I, I get to, to I, I hear that they're not very popular uh, for a couple of reasons. There was a thing with the, uh, the film tax credit. There was some stuff with the teachers union and the nurses union and, and, those caused a lot of controversy. It's it's a lot of talk, a lot too much to talk about now uh, to fit in this podcast. It's maybe a conversation for another time. But that's the current sitting government here in Nova Scotia. That's a really really interesting question, though. That's not something I expected uh, to chat with you about today. Yeah, thanks for sending that one in, Ian. Our final email comes in from Andrew. It's called Quotable Moments. Hi, ECL. Just got into the podcast last semester found that taking dives into my favorite childhood show is a great way to de-stress when being an adult gets kind of crazy. It's uh, that It works that way for us, too. My entire family quotes Arthur religiously. Just the other day, my mom referred to a pound as a lub in a text to me. Oh, my and I gosh. Used, and I used, the words, I used the words, bus a Louie in response. I was wondering if you ever quote the show in daily life, and if so, what you find to be the most quotable lines. My personal favorite is... Pretty cool stairs slash I just said the dumbest thing in the world. That's from Andrew. Thank you, Andrew. Um, it's hard for me to think of, uh, I guess, like uh, exact quotes, I suppose. But I imagine that if I do say any, it's probably DW. Something DW said. At, at work, uh, we say, uh, it takes a gentle hand to rule the land. <laughs> uh, quite a bit because there's a lot of things at the the coffee shop where it's like if you force it too hard it like won't work the way you want yeah kind of have to uh be careful with the amount of like pressure you're applying uh and i always think about that arthur moment what else um uh ooh, see i i gotta think about this because there's definitely specific ones that i like will recall um i i told you not to touch it from the infamous punching scene is something I'll say a lot, especially in Arthur's cadence where I'm like, I told you not to touch it. Um, and I don't really do this that much anymore, but I used to make my parents laugh all the time. Uh, when I was a kid, I would imitate DW falling off the balance beam for a comically long amount of time. So I do the like, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> um, there's, and, a, there's a good there's a good one in one of the episodes we're talking about today that I'm thinking of, but uh, we'll we'll get to that when we get to it. Uh, I also uh, would sometimes I always think about uh, uh, Buster going. I hope it's ice cream uh, from that one where uh, our there's Mr. Rappert singing the song about giving him more homework, and he's like, "I got a surprise for you," and he goes, "I hope it's ice cream." That's something I'll say sometimes too. I mean, I don't know if it's necessarily something you can relate back to the song itself, but I, you know, I probably say, yeah, a few times. <laughs> You're either referencing uh, Arthur or E-40. You're <laughs> fill it in uh, my cup. It's most likely Arthur, I'm afraid. <laughs> All right, thanks for the emails, everybody. That's at ElwoodCityLimits at gmail.com. And without further ado, let's get to this uh, pair. Oh, before we break into the episode, one more piece of house cleaning. We mentioned it at yeah. the end of last episode, uh, but I just wanted to remind everybody that voting is still open 
for the Best of Halifax Awards. All you have to do is go to bestofhalifax.com, scroll down to the section that says Media, and where it says uh, Best Podcast, put in your friends, me and Will, uh, at Elwood City Limits. Uh, that would be a huge, huge help. Uh, it's just so cool. Uh, I love the Best of Halifax Awards, and it would be awesome even to be nominated and get some recognition for being a Halifax-based podcast. Yeah, we started doing this push last year. Let's see if we can get farther this year. Let's see if we can get nominated. We're not necessarily expecting to win, but a nomination would make our days. Oh, my goodness. It would make my week, month, year. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. So we are starting off this one. Speaking of uh, something that you participate in in order to find out who is the best of something, this episode is called The Contest. And we've been uh, pretty much once we heard the name of this, we knew what it was. So, yeah, I've been looking forward for the. I didn't realize this uh, This episode was so late in the series. I mean, not late in the series compared to the whole, like, there's a lot of seasons, but I thought this was going to be season one, two, three. I was surprised that we're only getting to it now, but um, hey, delayed gratification. I was very excited to hear this is what we were watching. Indeed. Uh, the episode starts off actually something that we've seen before, which is the Arthur kids completely bored, sitting in like a. Uh, laying down on like a circle and uh, Francine saying too bad this isn't TV because then I could change the channel so we're already kind of setting up a very meta tone right. for what's to come. I mean, that's brother- the that's literally the very first line in the entire episode and it's already sort of kind of skirting the fourth wall because it is TV. Then they realize it's everybody there except for Buster. So they are trying to find him and figure out where he is. Maybe he's doing something interesting. So they look around for him. Then suddenly Francine spots him. He's up against a tree and writing something on a pad of paper. And everybody is irrationally afraid that he's doing homework. (laughs) They're worried he's like sick or something. Like he's lost it because he's doing homework. So they, they talk to him. He's like, no, no, no. I'm not doing homework. I'm actually doing something. I'm writing for a contest for a show called Andy and Company. And he says, I found it in the latest TV schedule magazine, which is a, a clear reference to TV Guide. Did you and your did you and your family ever get TV Guide when you were younger? No, 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 no. That was, was like a, a that was like a weekly thing for us. How are you gonna know what's gonna come on TV? We were I was a s I was a channel surfer. Well I would just watch like I Y T V maybe my parents read T V Guide, but I would just watch Y T V every night. Um, but yeah, how else would my parents figure out when Sequest was on? We had, we had to know when, which, uh, if ER was on that week and if it was a rerun or not. <laughs> I think my grandmother had TV Guide, so she could figure out I, when to watch Bonanza. I actually have an old TV Guide, uh, in my closet right now. It's a relic I bought at a wrestling show. It's like a 1998 TV Guide with Sable on the front cover. Ooh. It's pretty, it's pretty neat. Like... Kids, this is how we used to uh, figure out what was on TV channels at any given time throughout like a week. It was a weekly digest where it would tell you all the TV listings, and that's how you would know. You would either either that or go to Channel Eight, which is the kind of the TV Guide channel. Yeah, but I that think would we only were for think, so long. I think we were more of a Channel Eight kind of kind of family. Now that I think about it, that's a cold open. Buster says, "Oh no, the show is starting right now," and the episode gets into what is Andy and Company, and it's a parody in show of arthur essentially and uh, it, as, i felt as kids... almost personally attacked by this because not only do we get to see like a parody of arthur we get to see this almost bizarre world situation where all of the arthur gang are riffing on arthur and i oh i was terrified that they were going to say animal hierarchy they really skirt that line <laughs> of basically they're stealing our thunder and pointing out the same things that we've pointed out about arthur this whole time yeah, you're right. It does get very close, uh, and maybe that's where we learned it from because they're watching the show Andy and Company, and they're commenting on the inconsistencies that they see, which I thought was really funny just from a conceptual level of like the Arthur writers finally somewhat addressing maybe some of the criticisms that they got like in the show like – Andy's little sister is bothering him and he calls for mom. And then Muffy is like, why does he always call for his mother? She's like a slave, which is which is a well-worn Arthur trope. Whenever DW does something, he just goes, mom. 
Um, and, and, and brain brains talking about if they're animals, does their cafeteria serve bugs? Bugs and garbage. And then Francine's <laughs> like, if Andy's a mouse, why doesn't his dog eat him? And Arthur's like, Andy's not a mouse. He's a something. I'm not sure what. But the but the whole idea of this is that they find out about the contest where you can write into the Andy and Company show and you can pitch basically pitch them an episode and they might actually m- make an episode out of it which is a, a cheap way to get ideas <laughs> uh so buster has finished his idea and here's where we get the thrust of the episode it's where we're getting all of these tiny little stories there may be two or three minutes uh, of everybody's pitch to the Andean Company show. But the twist is is that they're all parodies of shows that were popular at the time. So like the late 90s, 1999. And it's it's such a, like in general, such a fascinating time capsule of the TV landscape at the time. It's true. Like some of these shows... Uh, I mean, I'll get to I'll get to this when we 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 sort of run them down in linear order. But a, a, a handful of the shows parodied here are before my time, even like a little old for me. Like it's definitely more early '90s than latter '90s. Um, but I also think it's really crazy the the vast variety of genres they decided to lampoon. Like you'd think we get a lot of referencing other PBS shows in the second episode, these, this two episode pair. Uh, and you'd think they would just be like all PBS shows. That'd be like the safe thing to do. Cause it's all the same company, but they really like get shows from everywhere. Uh, which is interesting. Well, I want to, I want to just contest that a little bit before your time, perhaps, but these, these are the shows at least in brief, uh, that were very popular. And from like, I'd say 97 to 99, and, and, I mean, in some of their cases, much long after that. Let's get into it. Maybe what I meant was, like, like I was very young at the time when these shows were popular, and they're definitely for an older audience. Not all of them, but uh, some of them very specifically. Yes, you're absolutely right. In fact, that's absolutely true of the first one. We hear Buster's story called The Day the Earth Was Saved, and immediately it's the Arthur character's animated in the style of South Park, which at the time, 1999, you know, you know, South Park is, um, I want to say, like, it's still very popular today. Oh, I, I, but, but 1999, like, I mean, maybe this is just because me and you watch so much wrestling that we understand how inescapably, uh, uh, monolithic the South Park brand was then. Uh, but this is when the movie was coming out. This is like all that stuff. Yeah, this is kind of it's kind of hard to explain to somebody watching South Park today of how like even though it looks pretty much the same, like it's the same style of animation and it's still very popular, I would probably argue that its peak in the in the late 90s was maybe even more of a cultural touchstone. It was like it was just a huge sensation mm-hmm. and the humor the humor was completely different. The uh I mean all you have to do is look at the oddities and see that guy holding around the Cartman doll. Yeah, and the road dog would have a would have a Cartman T shirt every right. now and then. All the all the Cartman signs at um, Monday Night Raw. Um, I thought it was an interesting detail that when they're they're sort of lampooning the style of South Park, they used the old pre because um, South Park in the only I think it's the only the first two seasons uh, I might be mistaken about this actually was like stop motion construction paper cutouts, and that's how they filmed it before they switched to like computer animation. And this is the old, like, cutout style. And South Park was very much, like, before the internet was a big thing. Like, the the early seasons, like, really, they are incredibly rough to watch nowadays. But they were, like, the memes of 1999. Mm-hmm. Like, Mr. Hanky, the Christmas Pooh, uh, you know, Kenny getting killed every episode... Like, all this kind of stuff was just embedded in the culture. Like, well, I remember playing the South Park pinball game at one point. Well, that's one of the thing, reasons where I'm, I was more familiar with this show at the time uh, than most other ones is because, you know, there was people trying to get this show off the air. Like, it, it, was a, it was a part of the 
cultural lexicon. It was it was that widespread. So even as a little kid who had never really watched South Park, I was very familiar with South Park just because the t-shirts were everywhere. And I heard like older kids talking about it. And I heard my parents talking about it. And the movie was around. So I was familiar with it. I just hadn't really watched it as I would have been like four or five at the time. Uh, unlike some of these other shows, which I probably didn't even realize what this was parroting when I first watched this Arthur episode when I was still a little kid. This was when I was just finding out about South Park, so seeing this, and I mean really still seeing this happening, is very surreal. Especially considering like South Park's reputation compared to Arthur, it's just really kind of bananas. Uh, well, to and see especially it how directly it references it. It's not even just an art style, like... DW, uh, not DW, Francine says, oh my god, uh, well, she doesn't say oh my god, but she says, hey, you squished Buster, which is a very direct you killed Kenny reference. It's about as close as they can get to the, like, the mimetic line as you can on public television for children. Like, they, there's no swearing, there's no references to killing, but it's like, yeah, you squished Buster, I wrote that down too. And, like, the characters themselves are, like, kind of a lot more abrasive, like, the voices are done in a lot more of a like a kind of a rougher style uh, to kind of imitate the rough around the edges style that South Park was as well. So it's a pretty knowing parody. And I mean, the animation looks spot on and it, the whole thing is like, you know, bu uh, a bunch of aliens come down in a UFO, they abduct Arthur, but they don't eat him because he's high in cholesterol. So they let him go. And then that's like, they save the earth. Like, and that's, and that's another thing. Like early South Park had this, fascination with like aliens that was one of the big plot points of like the first couple of seasons well i say plot points with scare quotes around it so it's a really good uh it's a really good parody it's like it definitely knows the source that it's drawing from and i, ma I imagine the people working on that show were on arthur were big fans of south park from the way that they treated it buster reads in the story immediately the first line after everybody hears it is arthur saying what do you mean i'm high in cholesterol He's very offended that he is, uh, his salt content is higher than most people's, for whatever reason. <laughs> yeah, like, he keeps, like, people have kind of moved on, and they're still just talking about, like, being excited about making their submissions, and uh, Arthur's still kind of harping on the fact that he wasn't eaten. Uh, he says, uh, I'm just as edible as anybody. <laughs> He's really miffed uh, that the aliens didn't want to eat him. Uh, I also liked the detail of, like, after Buster's, like, done telling his story, everybody's just kind of cross-armed, like, they don't really know what to make of it. <laughs> yeah, it's like everybody's incredibly specific visions, like, are kind of uh, met with more criticism, and none of them are universally liked, including Buster's. Uh, everybody sets out to make theirs. Arthur is at the table with a pen and paper, and he has this slightly pathetic uh dream of him of the cartoon character andy handing him an award and he's like thanks for writing that great story arthur do you want to hang out with us and be our friend and it's like arthur's greatest wish through this whole thing is being a cartoon character's best friend and it was it was just a little sad <laughs> it's like a twilight zone episode all i want to be and is a cartoon character's best friend little does he know he's a cartoon character yeah, really. And it's like just it, it's just kind of slightly like does Arthur think this is real? <laughs> sort of thing, but it's That's what um, I was wondering is like the implication even though the art style is completely different, is it like a live action television show? I don't think that's what they were going for though. It's just fun yeah. to think about. Uh so the next day at the Sugar Bowl, everybody gathers to read their episodes to each other, and this is the bulk of the rest of this episode of Arthur is everybody's stories. So my my notes I kind of uh, chop them up into different sections to make sure that uh, we talked about them each in turn. Uh, Muffy starts hers off with with hers is called My Life as a TV Show. Now, I don't know if this if the structure of the show itself is referencing anything in particular, but there are elements to her episode that are absolutely direct parodies of things in the popular culture. Namely, M Muffy is participating in a fashion show and in the front row are Arthur and Buster, and they are drawn in the style of Beavis and Butthead. Another thing that was big, actually, like, mid to late 90s. Like, but at this point, Beavis and Butthead Do America uh, had already been in theaters. 
And and Beavis and Butthead is one of the shows where I sort of totally miss the cultural phenomenon. Like, I know it was really, really, really popular, but as a kid, I was totally unaware of it. And now, looking back at it as an adult, it's one of those things where, coming to it later, uh, I could see the appeal and I could see why it's so popular, but it certainly is not really for me. I wasn't allowed to watch Beavis and Butthead when I was young because, of, of course, I was like eight and and yeah exactly like it it totally missed me and therefore i have no no love for it i don't really find it funny or anything like that but i know a lot of people who do like it and i certainly don't begrudge them that but i like my to... i like most mike judge things i like mike judge but oh, yeah sure. Be- beavis and butthead is very of its time in my opinion especially like i remember when they brought it back a couple of years ago and it didn't really like it. people were like oh, i don't know about this um, but, but of its time, it was, uh, maybe not as popular as South Park, but still as huge. Cause they, again, you said Beavis and Butthead do America. They had the whole movie, all that stuff. Uh, it was another one of those shows that parents were trying to get banned. Like, uh, South Park is like the main one, but like Beavis and Butthead and Jackass and all those shows around the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's a lot, it's a lot more, I'm, I might say it's, it's more fondly remembered because it's not around anymore. And so the people who grew up with it really have a lot of fond memories of it. It's kind of like. Uh, Jen and I recently watched the first episode of Daria. It's up on Crave TV, and it they're was, bringing it was, that back, by the way. Yeah, so I saw. We'll see about <laughs> that. Uh, and I kind of, I, I was never the hugest fan of Daria, but I kind of watched it when I was in junior high. It would have been more for my my sister's age group. She would have been late high school, early university. And Jenna was like, if I had watched this when when I was when this was originally airing, I would have loved it. But kind of. You know, right now, 2018 eyes, it's not uh, as groundbreaking as it was, which, it, again, kind of like you said, Lucas, Beavis and Butthead, Daria, all that kind of stuff, elements of their time. But it's interesting to see them represented here. And and I think they captured the essential look of both characters by transplanting on the Arthur and Buster and the uh, voices pretty, pretty, pretty well. Oh, yeah, absolutely. That's probably my, the most important part. And they, they really nail it. Uh, there's also a reference to uh, another PBS property, the Teletubbies. Uh, Buster makes the joke of, "Look, it's the fifth Teletubby," and so, and it's like weird to hear a PBS property mention another PBS property, especially in in terms of like it's like an insult. Yeah, like throwing a little shade on it, which is very interesting. Not uh, kittens got claws over there on the Arthur writing staff. Muffy, Muffy is part of this fashion show in this TV show. Uh, doesn't get as good of a reception. DW is out next, and man, she is pimping. She's got this gigantic purple hat with, like, rhinestones. I think she's got, like, platform shoes on, and she gets a huge reception. Uh, so much so that uh, Muffy's jealousy leads her to uh, devise a scheme to plant a stink bomb to ruin the reception. And to which Francine is like, that's so like you. I can I can totally see you doing that. And Muffy <laughs> says, I am a jealous person. Which is a great line. <laughs> yes, it is. The main criticism comes from the brain who doesn't want kids to be influenced by, you know, pettiness and jealousy and all this kind of stuff. Uh, it's it's interesting to, to see kind of moralizing from the kids about everybody else's uh, stories. Yeah, the brain does this later on when uh, um, some of the... the the shows later on involve hitting uh and it's weird to see the brain play the role of like the fcc like he's really clutching his pearls on what we're exposing (laughs) the kids to on this uh cartoon writing submission contest uh i he was really bugging me with all of his like oh like you can't have people solving the problems by having a stick bomb uh but then it kind of gets a little self-deprecating because he's like then they'll try and get revenge with a robot and like I think the other kids are like, well, who would have a robot? And Braid sort of he, like tugs at his collar, like, uh oh, like I've revealed too much about myself. An evil robot at that. So Brain is canonically has an evil robot stashed somewhere just for a rainy day. Like, speaking of Brain, his is next, and oh man, I wasn't ready for this. I completely forgot about this. So talk about shows that were at the height of their power in the late '90s. Uh, Brains is called, I guess I just called it Brains Laboratory because it is a direct reference to Dexter's Laboratory. You want to talk about shows that I watched day in and day out, Dexter's Lab, man. Yeah, so this would have been the show that at the time I would have been most familiar with. 
Um, yeah. Of all these, like most of them, it, it skew a lot older than what I was. But I watched my fair share of Dexter's Lab back in the day. It was it was big. It was like, um, don't quote me on this. I, I'm afraid I don't know his full history. But this was like one of Gendy Tartakovsky's like breakthrough shows that was that was indicative of his style and you can see it reflected here in the way that it's animated it's clear again uh the writing staff and the animation staff clearly are fans of the shows that they're parodying it's like a loving parody oh yeah and it's totally with the dexter's lab one i noticed that too will i i have a note right here for the dexter's lab is that the way they're so flawlessly able to imitate and in some cases like clean up these art styles is like really really impressive like to storyboard like four or five completely different art styles is is no small task. They're it's like they're they're aping the style, but also making it their own, which must have been incredibly difficult, especially for just one episode. Uh, so yeah, in this in this equation, Brain is the Dexter surrogate, and it's just and it's Brain's voice actor doing the vaguely European accent that Dexter does, but in the Brain voice, which I also think must have been very challenging. The rest of the kids are just like archetypes of what the characters in Dexter's lab are designed as. Uh, thought that was done very well. It's a brain inventing a new um, type of uh, liquid that grows hair on anything. So he like grows it on his tongue, on carrots, uh, on fish. And then it leads to uh, Arthur, who I guess is the Dee Dee surrogate of this, because he is not just in this one, but he's like the annoying sidekick in a couple of these uh, episodes. But he is like the act of annoyance to uh, the brain, and he like puts a bunch of the uh, the liquid on himself because brain says it's a type of deodorant in order to just get him to go away. And he just grows hair like Cousin It from the Adams Family. Uh, before he t- dumps it on himself, he yells, uh, "I ran all the way here, and I stink." Yeah. Uh, so he sees himself in the mirror, runs out. He runs into Bigfoot, who is also a victim of the hair growth formula, as Brain calls it. And apparently the message of Brain's episode was how urban legends start and uh, I guess how myths are propagated or something like that. It's it's a bit of a reach. Which brings us to now, Will. I had remembered that this episode, when he said it was called The Contest, was going to have a bunch of parodies of 90s cartoons i however did not remember that hulk hogan's actual lightning likeness they name him by name they name him by name they did. hulk hogan the hulk the hulkster you know him hollywood himself appeared in this episode well, you know something, Mean Gene. That is exactly what the the subject of the next story is, which is Francine in a collaboration with Binky. Right before the story gets started, she says, "I wrote the words, and Binky did the research." And I was like, "Flag on the play, getting Binky to do research, bad move." <laughs> and we see why at the end of the story. So you're right; it, it it is Francine even says the story starts off with Arthur in the wrestling ring against Hulk Hogan. Now you said Hulk Hogan's likeness. They're using his name, but they also kind of, I wouldn't say really his likeness. It's kind of just a large muscular blonde man, not, not an animal, but a man. Uh, But it's definitely not like the Hogan gear or like anything like that. He's got the mustache. He's got the bandizi. It's it's enough of his facial features for you to like make the leap. So uh you know they they certainly they certainly did what they could, but it's not the most Hulk Hogan thing you've ever seen. Uh it's them in this kind of uh the the style is very like shadowy. Kind of reminds me a bit of like Batman the animated series in a way. Mm. Just a just a little bit. And it's like them circling each other in the wrestling ring, growling at each other. Arthur stomps his foot, and Hulk Hogan, like, gives out a girlish scream and runs away. And the story ends with... <laughs> I, I, I really like this. Uh, uh, the ring announcer says, And now Arthur will face John L. Sullivan, Floyd Patterson, Barney Ross, and the United Press International. And Francine stops the story, kind of looks at Biggie's like, He fights United Press International? Biggie's like, sorry, I must have been on autopilot. I was just copying the names under a photo. Sorry. 
which is i would call that a good joke yeah. um i also like to point out that all of those are real boxers yeah so and i mean it, it's very interesting again to see humans in the world of arthur even if it is just a story i'm not exactly sure what this is uh you know parodying or referencing but i mean speaking of things that were at the height of their powers in 1999 wrestling so it was very topical to talk about wrestling and arthur frequently does make reference to just general professional wrestling mm. so it was it was very uh odd and uh surprising to see a specific reference to hulk hogan of all people even though definitely not his voice not really his likeness but uh you know that's as close as you can get without like without the hulkster beating down your door asking yeah. for those resi that resige money gremlins 2 this is not but i still appreciated it and i'm still shocked that they said the words hulk hogan and not like bulk bogan um yeah that was enough yeah. for me so that was that was very interesting especially for you and i uh brain makes a point here like you said before of just like i don't think it's appropriate to show hitting on a kid's show and francine says i don't think it's appropriate to show hair growth formula on a kid's show which touche now, this next one is Arthur's story. There actually isn't really a title for this, but I'm I, I, I'm wondering if you know what's being referenced in this uh, in this story. I know what it is, but I'm wondering if you do. So I only uh, if I'm not mistaken, because I'm I'm looking up right now actually to confirm my theory. But is this is it Doctor Katz? These days, I think it would. Uh, it's kind of a little-known animated show that I want to say was popular at the time. Doctor Cat's professional therapist is what this is. Uh, is what this is parodying. Oh my goodness! Uh, John Benjamin was on this show. Yeah, so I think the idea of it was that it was you know Doctor Katz, who is the character is a therapist, and I think part of the show was just he would have com they would draw in comedians at the time who uh, would kind of do their bits in the setting of a therapy room and they would animate it. So, like, I've seen clips of the show with Dave Chappelle, of uh, Mitch Hedberg, and, uh, yeah, I, I would not be surprised if H. John Benjamin was in there, too, because he would have been doing, like, home movies at the time and probably his own stand-up. Six seasons, 81 episodes? I, I, I think I've seen, like, 30 seconds of this show. Like, I was familiar with the squiggly art style. As a kid, I think I always got it mixed up with The Critic. Like, I think I thought Dr. Mm. Katz and The Critic were the same show. Uh, but, yeah, I, I never had seen a full episode. I will say this, though. I'm interested to go back and watch it because um, I loved – like, I could already tell so much of the show from the parody that Arthur does because they totally change up – uh, Arthur's delivery style uh, to make him sound like what I assume is like the sort of cadence someone on, on Dr. Katz would have, like the very dry sense of humor. Um, and it, it really, like, even though I'm not that familiar with the show, it's really, really, really funny. Um, yeah, it, it emulated the squiggly art style which Dr. Katz was known for at the time. It's definitely not something that stood the test of time like South Park did, but it was... It does, it, it, like, it does emulate it quite well, uh, and if you if you check it out on YouTube, like, you'll be able to kind of compare the two. Uh, I loved how Arthur's story is about his therapy at age eighteen, which is <laughs> the most Arthur thing ever of him just steeped in his anxiety. It, and you and you said like Arthur's delivery, and it's very much it's very much like it, it's it's very like normal, like just kind of understated, just like oh, the usual thing. The sister. Mm -hmm. It's Arthur's voice, but just kind of aged up, and, and and told and told in a manner that's very adult. By the way, love that he thinks eighteen is an adult, uh, and and also speaking of which, like he's, he even says like it takes it takes place ten years from now when I'm eighteen, and it's the the anecdote of him on the couch is him getting a new house at age eighteen. Keep dreaming, keep dreaming, kid. Hey, this was the nineties. We were in the Clinton era. Uh, that was that was a viable, maybe not at eighteen, but I don't think I'm gonna have a house when I'm like sixty four at this, uh, at this rate. You hear me, millennials? Hey, definitely not. His problem is that he asked DW to bring his car to his house. Which, by the way, DW would be fourteen here, so I don't know why she's allowed to drive. She says your car was just blah. I traded it in for something much nicer, and it's like this gaudy unicorn unicorn mobile. And that's pretty much the end of the story. It's just it's just Arthur reflecting on what his stresses will be in 10 years' time. 
which continue to be his little sister. Uh, so at that point, everybody's kind of obsessed with their own stories and winning the contest, and they start arguing about whose is better. But then the brain rightly says, let's just let the show decide. And uh, let's let let's let the TV decide which one is better. And Buster's like, ah, oh, TV. And they put, so they send their letters into the mailbox. And then Binky asks, how long will it be before we find out who won? This is another great joke, by the way. This is hilarious. And we cut to a title card that says, five years later. So we go from Arthur to basically... Arthur Shippoden here. Oh my goodness, <laughs> it's very much up my alley. I, and you know what? It really was because, like, I was I was stoked to see everybody's like teenager outfits. Uh, it was fun how like Arthur's wearing like a rugby shirt. Like everybody's got cool jackets. Um, everybody's voice is pretty much the same, though. Muffy's voice I feel like was a lot closer to the actual voice actress's voice as opposed to like her sort of putting on like a, a little kid affectation. Everybody. Uh, has aged up in terms of uh, um, their voice and uh, at least at least a little bit but I will say like so it's five years later it's implied that they're supposed to be 13 but the, but for 13 year olds they're friggin enormous <laughs> they look like they look like they've just uh, they're on their fall break from their first year in university well I mean I I think that's like when I was eight to me 13 year olds basically look like college students whereas now 13 year olds look like they're seven so uh, that's true. That's just one of those matters of perspective when you're a kid. Yeah, I th- you know what? That's a great point. So yeah, they all have their own kind of fashion and everything, uh, and they're watching the Andy and Company show. And who wins the contest? But Holly Holland, which is certainly not a character we're familiar with, and everybody is completely appalled that none of their episodes ended up winning. Someone has and a great mu- line. They say, uh, "Must be related to somebody." <laughs> uh, which is definitely something I would have said if someone else had won a TV contest. So they so they're dejected. They go back outside to the place they were at the beginning, kind of hanging out, wondering what to do. And then Arthur has the idea of coming up with more stories because even without the contest, they had a lot of fun. And Muffy suggests that they write about things that really happened to them. And then eventually they start pitching ideas that are episodes of Arthur. So maybe the implication here is that the Arthur TV show is written by the kids themselves. It's kind of like the end of season three of Arrested Development when Ron Howard's like, I don't know about, I don't know about uh, making a movie about the Bluth family. Might make a good TV show, though. <laughs> so d- we've, we've gone around the, around the sun here in terms of it being meta. So you could definitely imply that the Arthur TV show is written by the cast of Arthur, which I think is kind of neat. The episode actually ends with the Arthur characters full-on breaking the fourth wall back to their eight-year-old counterparts. Yeah, there's a fake animated studio set a la, like, Friends or something. And they are thanking the kids who sent in the actual story ideas uh, that wound up being in the episode. And... Uh, the person that they think at the end is Holly Holland of Canadian Oklahoma, who is the person who came up with the episode idea in the first place. And big shout out to Canadian Oklahoma. Yeah, and that's and that's the end of the episode. Uh, I will say here that uh, we don't have a word from us kids for this one. I do remember it though. It was it was them talking with Holly Holland. I was gonna ask because uh-huh. I vaguely remember that as well. I remember. I remember. She's like an Irish. She has like Irish step dancing lessons, if I remember. Hmm. Uh, we. I did get. I did get a couple of uh, a couple of tips on how to potentially find Holly Holland, uh, but I was not able to get in contact with her for this episode. So thanks for everybody's help. Uh, was not able to find her this time. That's okay. Uh, it was kind of a pie in the sky idea. Be it'd still be fun to talk to Holly Holland someday. But uh, that's for our yeah. that's for our serial esque true <laughs> story podcast finding Holly Holland. Uh, watch for it on NPR This American Life, where and, uh, just find finding Holland. Falling, that's, that's finding Holland. Do 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 do. We wondered what was Holly Holland doing today, and the answer m- you'll never believe what happened next. Miss Holland's opus. <laughs> All right. And uh, from there, we go into the second half of the episode from meta to surprise for to a little too real. I was OK. <laughs> you got the exact same stuff from this episode that I got that from this episode. And now I'm excited. How could how could I not? my man? <laughs> uh, the episode is called Prove It. 
Uh, the cold open is the brain talking directly to the camera about this is actually an interesting science lesson explaining how night and day works. Uh, it's kind of like uh, what am I thinking of? Cosmos. He's kind of doing it in a in a Cosmos style. I wrote to that down to Carl, too. Carl, Carl, Carl Sagan or Neil deGrasse Tyson. Yeah, I wrote that down as well. That he had, they had he had Sagan esque delivery. And I'm sure that was kind of the big touchstone at the time. Of course, Neil deGrasse Tyson's. Uh, version came out just a couple of years ago. Uh, Carl Sagan's, I mean, still very good all these years later. It turns out, like, Arthur comes up to him in his imagination and just like, Brain, you know you know that they can't understand you, and we, and it's, it's implied that he's talking about us, the audience, and Brain says, they're a lot smarter than you think, and it turns out he's actually talking about Kate and Pal, who he's been uh, teaching about uh, day and night. So I thought I thought that was I thought that was kind of cute, and the visuals in it were very interesting too. And I got to relearn how night and day work. It goes to As show adult- even a dog and a baby knew that the Earth was round. <laughs> oh yeah, take that, Bob. All oh, right, he. I forgot that Bob put out a song about the Earth being flat. That's very funny. Yep, he has that on record. <laughs> he has that. I'm, I'm waiting for his new mixtape where he talks about that H2O stands for hose to oxygen. <laughs> uh, I didn't know what that was going to be. A big part of this episode is hilariously a bit of blatant PBS propaganda for itself as Arthur and Buster start the episode watching their documentary series, Nova. You ever watch Nova? Well, when I saw this episode of Arthur, I was very interested to watch Nova, and I tried to one time, and I was like, this is boring. I really, I uh, actually, I, I, I didn't watch it often, but whenever I did, I actually, like, liked Nova a lot when I was a kid. No, nah, I was I was into more important stuff like Beyblade and Metabots. <laughs> so uh, I didn't have time for Nova. Didn't have time to expand my uh, my knowledge. So they're watching Nova. DW comes in to talk to them, and they immediately get... Instead of calling for his mom, Arthur calls for his dad to get DW out of there because they're trying to watch it for school. Uh, The beginning parts of this episode is about how everybody uh, treats DW like a little kid and kind of doesn't respect her intelligence or her place. Uh, there's, There's a part where Arthur and Francine are like spelling stuff out around DW because they know she can't spell. And it's funny, it just reminds me of uh, when I'm at dinner with my uh, my family and my little niece is there. She's two years old. And, of course, she, she can only talk in a rudimentary fashion. She certainly can't spell. So sometimes uh, we'll, be, we'll be like, you know, would she like some C-H-E-E-S-E? Because if we say cheese, then she'll go crazy and, like, we'll only want cheese. Or, like, would she like some B-R-E-A-D? You know, cheese and bread. That's what she Dang. wants all the time. We got yeah. a lot in common, me and her. Yeah. Elodie is, uh, is, is speak- speaking to my heart, she is. My greasy, greasy heart. All this all this time, DW is kind of playing with Kate, and she resents being essentially treated like a baby. Uh, There's also another scene where Arthur asks if he can go with uh, Buster to see an educational movie, Uh, one that we've seen before, 5,000 Explosions and a Supernova. I hope this show keeps referencing 5,000 Explosions and a Supernova, uh, like, up into the current seasons. Like, that show, either that movie's always in theaters, or they just keep adding more explosions until we get to, like, 5 million explosions and a Supernova. And again, DW insisting that nobody kind of takes her intelligence seriously. I imagine that uh, I I feel like we say this a lot, but um, if you're not a DW fan here, then your patience for her, your mileage may vary by this episode because there are there are points in this episode where she is very very whiny, and uh, her new voice actor is is good at being a, kind of the petulant side of DW, but it can be a little much sometimes. Uh, there, there is a great exchange here, and it kind of gets into what we've been hinting at, you, Lucas, you and I took away from this episode. Um, DW insisting that she is smart. Uh, to Arthur, she's talking to, she says, just because I haven't gone to school and haven't learned the things that you've learned doesn't mean you're smarter than me. And Arthur just says, yes, it does. <laughs> Which, boy, I wish more people were aware of that in this day and age. I'm sure we'll get into that in just in just a spell here. Uh, NDW wishing that she was taken more seriously. 
Arthur and the Brain are doing homework in his room, and DW's still kind of uh, taken with the Brain after he stayed over at Arthur's house. And Brain offers to play with her because he finishes his math homework way faster than Arthur was able to. Uh, And he kind of shows her some rudimentary science experiments uh, just with everyday household items and the old sundial the old put a needle in water and it'll it'll point north and they watch nova together and that's where brain kind of explains the basics of what science is yeah the the Uh, scientific method uh you propose a theory you conduct an experiment uh independent study to either prove or disprove said theory uh, and then you come to a conclusion I forget. I forget where DW says it, but there is a there is a part where she says, "Being right is so cool." Oh my goodness! So I, I mean, this is well. Actually, I'll wait. I I, I have a lot to I, say I, about how think, relevant this episode is, but I think we'll wait till DW sort of opens up her museum. Yeah, I think there's a yeah there's a better time in this episode to to get into that can of worms. Uh, so thanks to Brain, she's starting to kind of conduct herself in a bit more of a forward-facing uh, uh, intellectual manner, let's say. Like at the dinner table, I she love just kind this. of— This is the best DW stuff in this whole episode, is DW at the dinner table, sort of the enlightened in DW, uh, talking about, uh, Father, could you pass me the H2O? Uh, and uh, sort of trying to constantly disprove whatever Arthur says about, like, oh, you were annoying the brain. And she goes, I could disprove that with one call to Alan. Yeah, or just like, have you noticed that Kate Kate likes to spread her food on her face? Fascinating. No, oh, so this is this joke's actually really good because they set it up earlier in the episode. Whenever you see Kate, she's chewing on her ball. Um, mm. And DW says, uh, have you ever noticed that Kate likes to play with her food, but she tries to eat her ball, which is for playing? Fascinating. That actually is kind of interesting when you think about it. This leads to D- uh, Arthur is going to the... Explore the Elwood City Exploratorium with the brain. I believe that's what it's called. Uh, and the joke, and the joke from there on is that DW continually mispronounces it, like the Explain Aurorium and stuff like that. But DW really wants to go, and you know, ple- pleads with Arthur and her parents to let her go. And Arthur's like, you know, no, you wouldn't get it. And DW actually has a point here. She says that I bet, I bet the people who run that would be really happy to see someone. Of DW's age, there wanting to learn about science, which is true, and and yeah, it's it's just like eventually when we get to the exploratorium, it reminds me of uh, a place in Halifax that you and I have no doubt gone many times, the Discovery Center. Mm, I, which I've is, yet to which, go since they renovated it, but yes. You know, kind of like a science-based pl- kind of playground place where, you know, you can learn about all kinds of facts, but it's done in way really cool exper- experiments. And uh, that's a, a, absolutely done for little kids. And it seems like the Exploratorium is too. So Arthur's uh, really just wants DW out of his hair. His, uh, his reason for her not going is pretty baseless. Mom and dad kind of side with DW, or, or sorry, with Arthur. And, you know, dad says, you know, sweetheart, it might be boring for you. And DW looks like she's about to scream and then stops herself and gets a serene face and says, I'm too smart to get mad. <laughs> Which was the quote I was talking about. I, I've uh, I said that to myself earlier this week. Uh, she also she also declares that by the end of the week, before Arthur goes to the Exploratorium, he will be begging her to take him. So again, kind of much like Kate's ball, setting it up uh, to be paid off later. Uh, <laughs> this this is something that I remember for a very long time. Something I still think about is uh, you know DW leaves. She's very calm, and Arthur's like, "Wow, I thought she was gonna." you know, run around, scream, and cry that we weren't going to take her. And Dad says, maybe you underestimate her, Arthur. And then Arthur gives this fantastic dismissive laugh. He's just like, <laughs> yeah, good one, Dad. Like, <laughs> barely giving it any mind. It's so well delivered. I love it. This leads us into what I imagine is going to be the big, the big talking point of the episode. The next day, Arthur sees kind of a, a rope set up uh, actually, I think it's I think it's a garden hose to tie off the driveway into the backyard. And DW is there taking tickets to her uh, to some kind of something happening in the backyard. Arthur doesn't know what it is yet. Uh, so yes, DW asks him to pay five bucks as opposed to fifty cents. That's which right. Is her, if, uh, if you're 
under the age of seven, the price to get in is 50 cents. And if you're over the age of seven and a brother, the price is five bucks. Yeah. So Arthur eventually is able to get in with just the the potpourri he has in his pocket, which is... Uh, 75 cents. 75 cents. I'm just trying to get the picture here. A, uh, um, a little ring that goes whoo when you blow on it. Uh, a sour candy he borrowed from Buster. How are you gonna? How are you? How are you gonna borrow a sour candy? And my personal favorite, uh, half of a horse sticker, and it's the butt half. Why? Why does Arthur have a picture of a horse's butt in his pocket? I don't know. He's, he's got a skateboard. He's gonna put it on, or, or I, I, someone's gotta have that horse half a horse sticker on at his Etsy store. I'd put that on my laptop. D.W. leads him to the backyard, and it's. She has got DW's explain aurorium with real science experiments. And this sequence is DW taking everybody, which is like the Tibble twins, Emily and Arthur around to her exhibits, which is her quote unquote proving scientific truths, but really not at all. Just basically using kid logic. Like, uh, for example, um, the the one with the hose in the bucket. She's got like a hose in a bucket, and she says, uh, "Oh gosh, what 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 is it?" I'm uh, okay. Okay, so it's hose yeah, okay. to oxygen. Yes, there's oxygen yes, in the bucket, and so when she puts the hose in the bucket and turns on the hose, the water comes out. But yeah, so just stuff that is blatantly wrong, and DW is just mis- misrepresenting, and that's and that's the theme for her entire explain aurorium is that it's basically just child logic and it goes from stuff that is like not believable but like almost believable to just like straight up bs essentially but so and this then- this episode is very prescient like i was shocked by how much of dw's like child orium like bro logic uh museum of fake news and lies uh, with if you put it into the properly edited 30 minute YouTube video with scary music under people would believe like we live in a time where some people legitimately think that when you go into an airplane the windows are LED screens because the airplane doesn't actually take off because the earth's flat and the sky is a projected dome that the government is making a hologram of to try and trick you there's like we live in a time where People have this sort of distrust of um, distrust of experts in their fields. You know, it's like, what is he? Uh, they're th- th- these scientists at these universities. They're going to tell me what I can't understand with my own two eyes. Where's the horizon line? The Earth's not flat. It's it's this this distrust of the scientific method of research uh, for going all that stuff in lieu of I watched this YouTube video with scary music under it and now I believe that that this is how things are because I'm, I'm the only one who figured this out it's not the experts and this is all tackled in this Arthur episode but this is a problem in 2018 like I want to show this Arthur episode not even because it's a particularly good Arthur episode or anything but I want to force everybody in the world to watch this Arthur episode and be like see you need to trust the scientists sometimes. Sometimes if you don't understand something and someone else wrote about it in a book and it has, like, independently quantified research, it's okay to just trust that instead of some scary YouTube video. Prescient is the word, and you're you're 100% right because it's so strange how, like, this entire episode gets so many angles of, quote-unquote, fake news 100% correct. Like, DW is putting forth all of these you know, phony baloney theories about how things work and presenting them as fact. And the first encounter she has is like with Arthur. The like the first criticism she comes up against is Arthur, who is who knows that what she's saying is wrong, but also doesn't have the research to back up to say exactly why it's wrong. Which is I feel something like something you or I, who are not necessarily scientific experts, run into of like you know, somebody saying something false and then you being like, that's wrong, but I'm not informed enough to say exactly why. So, like, watching this in this era actually makes it kind of frustrating to watch at times uh, just because it's like DW patently wrong, but Arthur not being able to assert his case enough so everybody just takes DW at, at face value. 
Um, I do find it funny that as DW's Explainerorium goes on, uh, the only people who believe her are literal children, like children her age, and the conspiracy theorist on the show, Buster. Like, it, they come up and see him later, and Arthur's like, no, Buster, not you too. And he's like, wow, I didn't, like, I didn't know that th- that this was real. And Buster's like, it's not. And that, Buster's that, like, really? That, uh, some, of the stuff she's, some of the stuff she says sounds kind of right. Uh, that, that sequence where Arthur's like, uh, all these little kids are believing her, and they walk up and Buster's in the line, I actually howled with laughter. Uh, it's a great visual and just, like, joke of, like, of course – Buster would be falling for. It makes me really worried about, like, if we there was an Arthur Riverdale-esque reboot, how they would portray Buster's character. We talked about this early in Elwood City Limits, like episode three, about how Buster would might watch InfoWars or something, and never has it been more real than in this moment here. One of my favorite episode titles for our show is Buster Breitbart Baxter. <laughs> uh, yeah, exactly. And, and and Buster is kind of the, of the person who's like, who again takes what DW says at face value and kind of believes it and doesn't follow up to see if it's true, which is another trap that some people can fall into as well. And also the fact that DW is presenting these with like visual aids and like d- like dynamic presentation. So she's like winning them over through charisma, which is a, a tactic that people who utilize this method uh, live and die by. It's so your 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 words i can't do better than them oddly prescient is this episode even when arthur has like like D- dw says the sky is blue because of this and then arthur's like no 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 the sky is blue because air particles reflect blue light and then she just steamrolls him with a with a, just a bunch of nonsense and she wins over the crowd it's it's so strangely correct and that makes it a little a little bit frustrating to watch because you're just like you and I know not personally but you know people who are doing this in real life today and just seeing how it all works and you're just like man I can't believe that even a child could do this uh, eventually Arthur drags the brain to her explain Aurorium, which has gotten very popular and asks her to dis asks him to disprove her uh, DW, again, Brain hears her saying a fact that's clearly wrong, and Brain says, uh, no, actually, that's not true. Uh, and DW's call through most of this, as the episode is titled, is prove it. You know, she says to Arthur, you know, a couple times, hey, prove it. And Arthur's like, well, I, I can't really, or kind of turns it back on her, but to ineffectual, uh, degree. And Brain says, I can't exactly prove it, but other people have, you know, scientists and people who have done the research. And DW capturing, again, like just capturing this persona perfectly in this quote. She says, I don't believe you. You can't prove it because you're wrong. I, and just how, how many times have we heard that in the last few years? <laughs> uh, it's, 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 I think you hit the nail on the head earlier on in the episode where you say it's, it's almost too real. Like it border, border, I think it's important. Um, and it's an odd thing to say about something that came out in the 90s, uh, that it's important to, uh, to be tackled today. But I also think it does actually get so frustrating that it borderlines on, like, annoying. Like, almost almost too frustrating to watch. I think that might be one of my main criticisms of this episode is that um, a large portion of the episode is taken up by montages. First, um, sort of a montage of all the exhibits at uh, DW's Fakatorium, and then there's a montage of all the exhibits at the real Exploratorium later on in the episode, and both of those go, like, one or two things too long. Like, we sort of get the picture of DW's stick, like, one or two exhibits in, and then it just kind of keeps going. Uh, Same with the the real-life museum as well. Essentially, essentially, we can get into now about how the, how the episode wraps up. Of Arthur realizes that he can he, he can show DW how wrong she is by taking her to the Exploratorium with them on the weekend, and then he literally does go into mom into the into the living room where mom and dad are and says, "Please, can we take DW with us?" And they're like, "You want to take DW with you?" And there's like these dramatic zoom ins to Arthur's face of, "Yes, please, she has to go." And we get that montage of them at the Exploratorium, and the episode ends 
with DW saying, yeah, we, we, I told we you. We get a real Kaiser Soze moment here. <laughs> uh, that was one thing that sort of actually redeemed the episode for me is because uh, I was so frustrated with DW, but this almost justifies everything because we see that DW, uh, Arthur was playing checkers and DW was playing three dimensional chess. D- yeah, DW says this whole thing was a plot for her to get to go to the Exploratorium with Arthur. She even guaranteed that Arthur would beg her to come. And so, lo and behold, so he did. And Brain says, uh, maybe again, kind of says, maybe you underestimate DW. She's a lot She's a lot smarter than you think. And Arthur just says, a smart DW? Boo, I don't think the world's ready for that. And I will, And I will note here, DW used fake facts not because she really believed them, but to further her own agenda. Nudge, nudge, nudge. Yeah, this is really DW actually using it to using fake facts to get what she wanted and then immediately abandoning them is kind of the ultimate swerve. It's me, Austin. Oh my gosh. It's the earth was round the whole time. So yeah, that that was it, it made DW look very clever, albeit we had to go through her being very annoying in order to get there. So that's the end of that episode. Wild time watching that in 2018. All right, uh, let's move it back now to the contest. Uh, Lucas, what did you make of that episode? I mean, how could you not have a good time watching the contest? It's not <laughs> like any other Arthur episode where it doesn't really have a moral uh, or like a plot, really. It's just kind of like, let's see the Arthur writers and animators tackle all these popular TV shows of the 90s. But I think, like, especially for me and you specifically, it's just a blast. Like, there's nothing not to like about it. Uh, in terms of the way they adapt the art styles and even the way they adapt the dialogue and the styles of jokes and the fact that they were all... All the fake stories in the episode are submitted by actual kids and sort of have all have beginning, middle, and ends. Uh, the whole thing's just like a fun time. But that being said, it, it, it's it's candy, right? It's not a, it's not a big three-course meal, uh... There's a reason I'm being so concise with my thoughts on it, and it's just that there's not really a lot to talk about besides, like, breaking apart the references and stuff like that. But, I mean, I think if you're a fan of Arthur or not the 90s, uh, it's just got to be seen. Yeah, I think that the appeal of both of these episodes depends on what age you're watching them at. I mean, I think I liked them both when I was a kid, but it definitely improves, especially this first one, if you're of a certain age like we are, which is weird to say considering that we're both still pretty young. But if you have any memories of the 90s or if you kind of know what most of these are referencing, this is a lot of fun. And I can't, like I kept thinking like that the writers and the animators and even the voice actors must have had a lot of fun making this because it's so outside of the box for Arthur. It's so self-reflexive and kind of looking in on itself, especially with the Andy and company parts of it. And I just I, I just love when a show does that, especially one like a PBS kids show, which almost has no business doing that because like it's just for little kids and who could be enjoying this at a young age. But it's clear that Arthur is not meant to just reach out to younger kids. This is something that for us has gotten a lot better with age. And I, I you're right. I really do appreciate it. This is just a fun curiosity of like, hey, remember that Arthur episode where they like parodied South Park and like Beavis and Butthead and all this kind of stuff? It's just an it's just a very interesting relic of Arthur's time on the air, considering how, you know, it's still going uh into 2018 with five with you know four more years on the way but it's been around long enough that it 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 has been contemporaries with some of these shows that is referencing i also got to point out it does have hulk hogan in the episode which like if you put hulk hogan in a bad arthur episode it's gonna get bonus points from me uh and it just so happens that they put hulk hogan in a pretty good arthur episode so thumbs up for that on to prove it, uh, th- again, this kind of uh, is depending on where you are and especially depending on how much you read into it. Now, we are – this is essentially <laughs> kind of – not it's not a job for us, but this is, what we, like, this is what we do. We look too much into Arthur episodes, but watching it just as an adult in the year 2018, it's impossible to not see the parallels, which they didn't intend at the time – but it's so strangely specific that I can't believe 
how much the stars had to align for this to happen. The episode itself, I think, is just kind of okay. Like, I think this is actually one of the most annoying that DW's ever been, which is weird because uh, they're really amping up her annoying factor, first with Arthur's big hit in this season and then with this one. But it, it it's... Um, it, it does prove a point and actually like makes her seem very intelligent, which is kind of the point of the whole episode. So it, it serves uh, the way that she is serves an end. It's a means to an end. And I think that it's actually uh, pretty smart for doing that. And some of some of the the theory, the cockamamie theories that she had for uh, uh, why things work were actually pretty funny uh, that she thought of herself. Uh, and yeah, it's such an, interesting distillation you, you lucas you said that you would show this to like everybody <laughs> like especially every adult in the year like in the year that we live in because it really is boiling down how these types of how, no i won't say these types of people but how this mindset works uh and it's fascinating to see it from the outside and it captured so well i think yeah, like, I, I would say, first off, just the most basic Arthur parts of this episode that I really liked. Uh, I really like the, the dinner table scene where uh, DW's kind of trying to show off, like, how smart she is. I actually, like, I've been critical of the brain because sometimes he's just too, like, Sheldon from Big Bang theory e for my taste. Uh, but I, I liked Brain's characterization in this episode and how near the end he started to get frustrated as well. Uh, and it's sort of at the, the start when he's trying to help DW out. I liked the... the uh, sort of cameo from Nova, just live action footage in our Arthur episode was fun. Uh, but yeah, like watching the episode, I was frustrated with DW. Like you said, it's, 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 she's annoying, but I don't think it's annoying because of a whiny DW performance. I think it's annoying because these kind of people in real life annoy me. Like when I have to listen to someone go on and on about like the horizon line, uh, and that the earth is flat, I get the same frustration I got from this Arthur episode. And it's just so insane because it's such a unique uh, a, a unique phenomena that's kind of specific to, like, the past three years. Like, I feel like if you had said, oh, like, I'm a person with a job and a, a pension and, and, you know, a house and I, I do all this stuff and I also happen to think the Earth's flat and we shouldn't vaccinate kids. If you said that, like, ten years ago, I think you'd be laughed out of, you know, you'd be a, a, a quack. But that's becoming more and more prevalent these days. So it's, to take a word out of yours and DW's mouth, fascinating. Uh, and so, like I said, the big criticism with the entertainment factor of this episode is I think all the montages go a few a uh, few segments too long, and it kind of gets in the way of the flow of the plot. Uh, DW's just showing us one too many fake things. They got too in love with their, their fake thing jokes. Uh, but... I, 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 it's one of those episodes that, in retrospect, talking about it, like, it, it, it just, I, it's one that I would have to recommend to someone watch, just to show, like, Arthur is a show that is able to, uh, we always talk about how the really great moral Arthur episodes are sort of able to tackle something, um, and still be relevant to this day, like, oh, these are lessons you need to learn about how to treat your friends, or, uh, what happens when people come from different cultural backgrounds, and how to deal with that, or how to deal with a friend moving away, like, really specific, uh, situations that are great lessons to learn, and, and, and sometimes lessons that other shows don't talk about, but this is just crazy, because this is, like, something I want to, I want to shout this episode at adults that I meet daily, uh, so to see it tackled in this show from the 90s, it's almost indescribable, like, how, how odd this is. It's like an Arthur episode fallen out of an alternate universe or something where it was made in 2018. Uh, I don't know if that's necessarily a recommendation or what, but I think the fact that we've said so much about it already speaks for itself. I would recommend both of these stories to uh, older fans of Arthur yes. who are listening to our podcast. I think you would get a lot out of this if you haven't watched the episode yet. Uh, please go back and do so. Uh, I think you I think you would get a lot out of it. And actually, the more I think about it, you could also take the contest as like a potential like series finale to Arthur if you really wanted to. Like that's where it eventually all ends up. Interesting. You're that right. could be that could be your kind of theory. All right. So that's what we thought. 
Man, I can imagine this might uh, spark some debate, maybe just some lively thoughts. And if you have any, you can send them our way. And here are the ways to do that. We are on social media. First off, facebook.com slash Elwood City Limits. You can also rank the podcast over there, like our friend Sam Solero did this week. A five-star review. Thank you, Sam. Very much appreciated. It means a lot to know that uh, this podcast gets people through their week. That's, uh, That's a big reason why we keep doing it, and it's great to hear. On Twitter, we are at ECL Podcast. On Tumblr, elwoodcitylimits.tumblr.com. You can feel free to send us an ask, or you can send us an email, elwoodcitylimits at gmail.com. Also, if you feel so inclined and you'd like to listen to our bonus episodes, a.k.a. the filibuster episodes, you can donate to our Patreon, patreon.com slash elwoodcitylimits. And, of course, we have a new Patreon donator this month. Ian, thank you very much for adding yours, and we very much appreciate it. Hope you enjoy the filibusters over there. More to come on the weeks where, excuse me, on the weeks where uh, we are not able to record a full-blown ECL episode. And, of course, you can listen to those full-blown ECL episodes uh, on... uh, On, uh, excuse me, one sec, on Apple Podcasts, on Google Play, and at elwoodcitylimits.libsyn.com. Lucas, uh, are you on Facebook right now? Uh, whew, no, why? Whoa, whoa. I'm gonna, I'm gonna send, I'm gonna send you, a, I'm gonna send you a message of something that Chrissy Teigen just posted on Instagram. Oh my goodness, this is live. We, we, we're, I'm getting word. I'm getting a communique. Oh my goodness, Facebook chat. I'll pull this up on my phone. It's uh, Chrissy Teigen is posting this on Thursday night, 2018, <laughs> June 21st. Yeah, messages. It's already got a million likes. Chrissy Teigen shared a photo of Luna with Arthur, maybe her best John Legend troll. <laughs> I'm glad T- Chrissy Teigen's on the right side of history, and she agrees. With all of us, that John Legend does indeed look like Arthur, and he seems to take it in stride. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Hey, man, the Arthur brand—it's good for you. You gotta, you gotta roll with the punches on that Luna one. Luna and Daddy. That's funny. Uh, yeah. So you can get at us those ways. We would really love to hear from you. And Lucas, I have a feeling that I'm gonna love hearing from you the next time we record a full-blown episode, because. Next time, it's your favorite episode of Arthur. Oh my goodness gracious! Where it's it's been really hot around here these past couple days, so I think it's time to chill out. Am I right, Will? I agree. In fact, right now I'm pretty overheated, so I don't know if I would go this far. But uh, whether hot, whether rain, snow, sleet, or hail, next time on ECL, it's going to be the blizzard which is going to be followed up with The Rat Who Came to Dinner, the blizzard being Lucas Mancini's favorite episode of Arthur. We'll see if it stands up to the test of time. I can't wait. I'm really interested to see what you think of it. And interested to hear from you guys, too, so make sure that, uh, well, you keep talking to us. Love to hear from you. Uh, This is Will Young for Elwood City Limits. Thanks for joining us for another episode. And for Lucas Mancini. We'll see you next time. Make sure to bundle up for the blizzard ahead.